if you have been in a church really at all, uh, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Oftentimes there is um, there is this tension that exists between the pastor and the church. You know, the church may have this expectation of the pastor, and the pastor kind of has this expectation, and both aren't seeing their expectations being met. And so there's this conflict. Um, and so the, really the question is that, that all of this comes from is, is whose church is it and who does what? Because these questions aren't answered, there's just this this tension that's going to exist. And if you don't, Chris Songson says, in the absence of clarity, people come to their own conclusions. Sometimes people do church a certain way because they've always done it that way. A lot of times, traditional uh, denominations will, will do how they do things a certain way. And even though it's not biblical, it's not efficient, it's not um, practical, it's not really reaching anybody new, it's not really reaching the ones that you got, they'll still stick to the same model over and over again because they've been doing it like that for a couple hundred years. Now remember, if the church has existed for thousands of years and we're doing something it's because we've been doing it for hundreds of years, we might want to reanalyze that. Um, I mean, Sunday school, for instance, was a great idea back in the day, but in the modern world, in America, it's not that great of an idea because you've got people who are already unwilling to come to one, let alone two services, and then you're asking them to go to service before the service. That just doesn't make sense. Um, I, I know it had a point back in the day, but now it's become a, a useless repetition. Um, in the ministries that we do, we have to make sure that we do things with, with purpose. We don't just do things because we do them. Why do you do that? You know, like a lot of churches, oh, well, we do small church, small groups. That's fine. Why do you do a small group? Well, because this person said to do it. Does it work for your area? Is it what the people actually need? Is it reaching people? Is it reaching new people? Is it expanding the vision? Is it a safe does it stay true to whatever the goal and the purposes of your church? So with that being said, let's look very quickly at this tension. First off, whose church is it? Now, this surprises many people, but it's not our church. It's not the pastor's church. And it's not the elders or bishops or deacons or whoever you think um, bosses the pastor around. It's not their church either. It is Christ's church. It is God's church. And God himself appoints the pastor. Now, what happens when, when, there's, um, when there's a bad pastor? Let me put it like this. A lot of times, it's more of your, your, um, your bias. And I will once again quote, quote Chris Songson. It's not your job to replace what God has put in place. And I couldn't agree more. Um, if you disagree with the, with the direction of the pastor, go somewhere else. But honestly, if it's if it's something where it's immoral, that's something else. But if he's reaching people, or even if he's just relaying a foundation, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. You kind of just have to, once again, respect that he's the one who God appointed. Um, or you can go and be bitter and sit in your house and do Bible studies and never grow. Whatever you want to do. Um, so, okay, God appointed this person to do this thing. And except for the case of immorality, where it is confirmed by multiple witnesses, it's his job to do it. Um, so, okay, then with that being said, the elders or, or the board or whoever that is, it's not their job to keep the pastor in check. It's not their job to make sure that he does his job. It's their job to help him do his job. So he tells them what to do, they go do it. They don't stand over him and constantly look for a reason to get rid of him. Look at your church and say, how many pastors have we had in the past five years, in the past ten years? Has it been the same one? Now, you also run into another conflict when you've had the pastor for too long, like 50, 60 years, not with the pastor himself, but with getting a new pastor. Because everybody's looking back to that old pastor and saying, we want him again, but he's dead. He's gone. You're getting a new pastor. He's going to have different ideas, different views. He's going to take the church in a different direction because he's a different leader. And you have to be okay with that. What, what the, the, a lot of the problem is, is sometimes we kind of treat leaders like they are, um, um, like we are their boss. And that's just not really how it goes. The church has a structure. And we are all equals, but God appoints some as the leaders and some as the followers. So if you are not the leader, if you are not the pastor, remember that God has appointed you as a follower. So follow well. Support well. I'm not saying being a, be a yes man. If you have a, a genuine disagreement about something and you're not always giving disagreements about everything, 
Go, go and tell the pastor one-on-one, -on -one or the, whoever's in charge of the thing. Hey, I, I, had a, I had an idea. And if they don't listen, fine. But don't always try and stick your nose in other people's ministries when you yourself don't do anything. It's very, very common for people to go to the pastor and say, Hey, I don't like the children's ministry. I don't like how you're doing the children's ministry. I think you need a children's ministry. But then they won't actually volunteer or contribute. They just want to criticize what's already in place. They won't do anything to help the situation, they just want to go and complain to the pastor, as though the pastor is some kind of a sounding board. So then what some of the some of the board tries to do is they try to um, take up the slack and filter the complaints, which sometimes can work, but usually does not. Um, it can work if it's under the pastor's direction and guidance, and he has facilitated it. If it's just something where you're going and listening to complaints, then you're not doing your job and you should step down as being on the board. Your job is to support the pastor and make his job easier. So everything you do ask, is this making it easier for him or making it harder for him? If you don't like the pastor, I'm gonna already figure out that answer. So you got this structure, and if people aren't willing to contribute, there's not much you can do about that. See, the pastor is not an entertainer. He's not there for to preach the perfect sermon for you, to look perfect in, in his role, he wear, dress exactly how you want him to dress, and uh, talks about all the things that you want him to dress. Well, pastor, I don't think that, I think you should talk about hell more. Well, last time I checked, it's the pastor's job to make sure that he's doing better in his, in his ministry, to keep focused, to preach on what he thinks God is telling him to preach on. And so there's that. And it's not your job to do that. Remember that. The biggest conflict between the pastor and the church is when people think that it's their job to do something that's not their job to do. So next is the final step that you've got. The pastor, the board, the sheep. The sheep are under the shepherd, and the shepherd is under the head shepherd. Now, I'm in a, I'm in a denomination called the Assemblies of God. How we do things is a little bit different. We've got your congregation, um, volunteers, which are actually, I think, are, I think we actually consider them the same level. Then there's um, uh, the uh, associate pastor, pastors, and the lead pastor. And then we have the board, which is not really under the pastors, but not really over them either. It's kind of like a separate entity. Basically, the pastor is the head of the church, and I support him, and the board supports him. The board is under the pastor, and the associate pastors are under the pastor. But the board isn't under me, and I'm not under them. Does that kind of make sense? So maybe maybe think of it more of as instead of they're over here, think of it more of as a triangle or a pyramid. You got the pastor, and then you got the associate pastors on the board. The two things that are both under the pastor, but not necessarily under each other. However, they do help each other, and once again, are appointed by the pastor. So there's that whole thing there. We, that's not how the Sunday's God does it necessarily. That's just how we our church individually does it. So then the pastor himself is under a local. Um, group, I think it's called the Presbyter, who's under the state, who's under the um, head office, and that's governed by a board, and then that is under God. So there's that whole structure there. So whose church is it not yours? The second, the second big question that needs to, be asked, needs to be answered is, what is the pastor's job? And surprisingly, it's nothing that he's held to in, modern, in, in the modern respect. See, the problem is, is that pastors are held to too high of a standard and are seen as almost like gods. And then they're expected to do a bunch of stuff that is not actually in their power to do. First off, let me see if I can get some better lighting here. Uh, first off, it's not their job to entertain. It's not their job for every single week to spoon feed you because you refuse to grow. It's not their job that every single time that you have a problem with somebody, you go and tell the pastor. Pastor, they did this. Pastor, I don't like that person. Pastor, this. That's not their job, okay? First off, the pastor is equal to other people in the church. His role is higher, okay? He's not a god. He is just a person. He has normal normal problems, normal struggle, struggles. Then, um, but he's saved just like you. The only thing that separates him from you is that he has been appointed by God to lead the church, and you have not. That's how that goes. Uh, his main job is to oversee. Actually, the word itself in the Greek means overseer. So what is his job predominantly to do? To oversee. He watches out for the church. He, he watches over them. Um, has things run smoothly. If that's, he leads them in the direction they need to go. 
Uh, another big job of a pastor is to combat heresy, um, to not let false teaching just spread rampant. Um, he, he, like once again, overseeing, he oversees the other teachers under him. Um, he teaches. It's a big role throughout scripture. Um, he encourages and rebuke. That's, repeat, that's repeated often. Um, and then he has the normal roles as a Christian, you know, uh, praying for people, um, you know, rubbing shoulders with people, getting to know people, inviting them to church, that kind of stuff. Normal Christian stuff. But the problem is in thinking that the pa it's the pastor's job to go and visit people in the hospital. That's all of our job. That's not the pastor's job. If somebody from church has visited you, that's a church visit. If you're in prison and somebody from a church comes to visit you, it doesn't have to be the pastor. If a home visit, well, the pastor didn't come and visit me in my home. That's not his job. That's the church's job for one another. So go, go to church and get plugged in. And small groups, I think, are good for this, but I've also seen them not be good for this. It really depends how you use them. Um, where people can get together and there's a close-knit group. And, and so then if there's a need, they can take it among, among themselves. And then if it needs to, it can escalate to the pastor but for the for the most part a lot of the what got what got talked about in the bible was um was for everybody to do for instance when it says your neighbor has something against you you go and apologize to them you see something somebody in error that doesn't say anything about go to the pastor it says you go to them then if they don't listen then take somebody else with you and then if they still don't listen then take it to the pastor see it's not our job to keep tabs on the pastor it's not our job to to, um, to criticize and critique what the pastor is doing, if he's doing his job good, if he could, doing, could be doing it better, none of that. It's not our job to demand that the pastor does a bunch of home visits and, and use up all, all his time like that. All of these things, the Bible never said that a pastor was responsible for doing that. It said that the church was responsible for doing that. So what is the church's job? The church's job is a home and prison and hospital visits. The church's job is serving and loving and, and, and running ministries and that kind of stuff. Uh, obviously, you shouldn't run a ministry unless the pastor has allowed you to, but still. Uh, it's the church's job to reach out to the needy. It's the church's job to invite people. It's the church's job to get to know them. What we do is we like to sit back on our butts and expect for the pastor to do all the work and entertain us and spoon feed us and do everything that we want him to do. We, he doesn't work for us. I know that that's, but I play, I pay my taxes. I mean, my my tithes and my offering. And I, I've I've paid them for. That's good. That means you're obeying God. That doesn't mean that the pastor's under your thumb. It also doesn't mean that you get to run the church how you see fit. In fact, when you argue over the authority and the power of the church with the pastor, you're actually arguing with God because God's the one who's who appointed them there. And if you're fighting God on something, don't you think that maybe you might be wrong? So with that being said, rather than t and rather than being so antagonistic towards the pastor, maybe you should spend more time in prayer. Maybe you should spend less time talking about the pastor and spend more time praying for him. Maybe you shouldn't put him on a pedestal so that everybody can look at him, but instead cover him with prayer. Ask, how can I help you? How can I make your job better? How can I make your job easier? How can we achieve the goal of reaching our city or our town or our village or whatever for Christ? How can we do this? better. So that takes us to the face of the church. Oftentimes in small churches, the oh, that's so-and-so's church. That's Bob's church. That's Gary's church. So let's talk real quick about the face of the church. How do you change that and why does that even exist? See, look at this. These are the things that a church does. You've got the sermons. Who does the sermons? Well, typically the pastor. Who does the visits? Well, typically the pastor. Who does the ministries? Typically the pastor. Who does the counseling? Typically the pastor. So whose church is it? Well, we say, okay, we are the church, but then we say, okay, it's actually pastor's church. So now when that pastor is gone, the church is gone because he is nothing more than a charismatic leader. Just like in, all throughout history, the, the event itself was not strong because it was founded on one person. Now, we see this happen frequently with, with the different barbarian tribes as they tried to achieve um, nationhood. You know, you'd have a bunch of these tribes and they'd all unite together under one leader. And then once that leader was gone, the tribes just wouldn't know what to do. Who, who's going to lead us now? And it's the exact same thing with churches. You've got a bunch of, maybe some of them are Christians, maybe some of them aren't. I don't know. Not really my, what my point is, but you've got a bunch of these Christians together. And they have no direction or purpose, but they want to continue the same cycle of going to church every Sunday because that's what they've always done. 
They don't want to get involved in ministry. They don't want to grow. But here's the thing. The mark of a, of a true growing Christian is that they are serving and they are feeding themselves and feeding others. That's the mark of a true growing Christian. That no longer are you gossiping and complaining about people, but now you're encouraging them. Complete 180. Completely different direction. And uh, where one exists, the other one can't. And so the question then, then is, what? who is the face of the church? I go to Blank's church. Well, why shouldn't they think that it's so-and-so's church? Because they're the ones who do all the stuff. They're the face of it. If you die, does the church continue on the path that you have set? If you were removed right now, how would your church handle it? Are there are there checks in place that would keep the church in the in the healthy direction that they would know who were who and now has authority? How, how do we replace you? Would they know what to do? Is are there any checks in place? If our pastor suddenly dies, there's two associate pastors that can pick up the slack and continue on the path until either one of us becomes a senior or we get a different senior pastor. Either way, there are checks in place, and there's the board too. So there's multiple checks for our church. If the main leader is gone and the church would fall apart, then you don't have a church. You have a cult of so-and-so, a cult of Bob, a cult of Gary, a cult of whoever the pastor was. If you step back, what would they do naturally? What is the, you Just be aware of this. What is the natural flow of your church? Are they naturally more introverted? Well, then what can you do to keep them on the right focus as a pastor, as a leader? Um, these are these are questions that you need to know. You need to be looking at this. Assess the health of your church and then say, what do I want and what does the Bible want for them? And how can I get them there? And then start making plans. And then start start winning people over onto your side about this is the direction we need to go. And then start slowly and gradually making changes. And then start it'll start growing and gaining momentum in years, not in days. So once again, take time with this. Um, so if you don't want it to be so-and-so's church, you have to get people involved, and the church has to start doing what the church is actually called to do. Unfortunately, you might lose a lot of people who, who are faithful to sitting in the pew every week. You, you might lose some of them to gain real Christians who actually serve and actually do what God has called them and told them to do. But remember this, if the church so far...